Beth Woodward. Um, I've been retired for five years from the city where I worked for nine years as a senior management auditor. And um, uh, one of my focuses was construction audits there. In fact, I got certified as a construction auditor because that certification became available during that time. And that was probably based mostly on my past work with CH Tom Hill for 17 years, where I served in several capacities, mainly uh, engineering technician and um, project manager. Engineering manager was my title when I left there. That's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> Great. How about Greg? Do we have an order supposed to go in? No, not at all. Just feel free to introduce yourselves one by one. Okay. Well, this is, uh, I'm Greg DiLoretto. I've been on the committee, the uh, BAC, since I guess February. Uh, I'm re I retired seven years ago uh, as the chief executive from the Tuolumne Valley Water District and spent 17 years as a city engineer and public works director. I'm a graduate of Franklin High School and Kellogg Grade School, so I get this is kind of fun to watch these projects uh, happen. And uh, I'm the past president of the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2013, chair of their committee on America's infrastructure, which does the report card, and I'm now the chair emeritus of that. Great, thank you. So it's hard to follow that. This is uh, Dick Steinberge. I've been on the BAC for, uh, I guess, about a year and a half. I've lost track a little bit. Um, I retired. I'm a retired civil engineer, retired in 2017 from the Beaverton School District as executive administrator for facilities responsible for their bond programs, maintenance, and, and uh, basically anything to do with the infrastructure. I, I did that for about 10 years before that. I, uh, for a couple of years, I was chief engineer of the Portland Water Bureau, but for 26 years before that, I was a Navy civil engineer corps officer and um, worked on shore facilities issues, construction and maintenance for the Navy. Great, thank you, Dick. I think that leaves Tom. Yeah, I'm Tom Peterson. I've been on the BAC since its inception. Uh, in fact, I've been on okay. select uh, history and on, and um, I worked for the port to Portland for 32 years. The last 15 years, I was director of engineering and construction. Um, for three retired. years, I also worked on the infrastructure report card with Greg. I wrote a couple chapters. Uh, um, and was involved in the Oregon Resilience Plan and some other things besides my uh, time work. Uh, my background, oddly enough, was electrical engineering <laughs> and uh, ended up uh, managing a large civil engineering uh, department mm -hmm. and oversaw a lot of big uh, and diverse types of cranes to, <clears throat> to industrial developments to Bridges to, to airport expansions, all kinds of different stuff. I mean, background in, so I had a fun career. Now I built all, all houses. <laughs> I think the, that's all the BAC members. Um, my name is Tenzin Gonta. Um, I've been a public sector performance auditor for about 15 years, served at the state, and now working at the city of Portland. Um, maybe we can invite the PPS staff to do a quick round of introductions as well. I think, uh, maybe I think start Darren's with Dan. first on my list here. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Young, uh, Chief Operating Officer here at PPS. Uh, and before that, I was the uh, Senior Director of the Office of Modernization. So very familiar with the uh, auditing process. And, Aaron, you want to go um, Peggy, Dan, Marina, oh. do, do you want, I'll just go next and then we do Scott and Darren if that's all right. If so, it's tough to kind of find the order here. 
Um, Marina Cresswell, I'm the Senior Director of the Office of School Modernization, um, the current Senior Director of the Office. Uh, Scott, if you want to go next. Yeah, so my name's Scott Farrell. I'm the Program Manager, uh, Engineer by Education, GC in my background. Uh, I'm also a uh, Certified Construction Manager um, with CBRE HERI. Um, I sat in the chair in between Marina and Dan. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Darren. Uh, Darren Lee, I'm with CBRE Geary. I'm the deputy program manager for OSM, but also fulfilling an interim uh, director of construction role. Um, been with the bond program since 2014. Great, and then I think Schoberg Evanshank for the last round of introductions. Sure, I'll go ahead. I'm Kathy Brady. I'm a partner with Shiberg Evanshank Consulting, and uh, I used to work at the State Auditor's Office in California, so I've been doing audits for a long time, um, a lot with construction, but we do all sorts of other kinds of audits as well. All right, I'm Leanne Liu. I'm a director with Shiberg Evanshank Consulting, and I'm just your everyday auditor. Well, thanks for everyone for being here on an off cycle meeting of the BAC. Um, I wanted to kind of share three comments maybe before we kick off with the audit presentation. Um, first, as a reminder uh, for folks who are new, the charter requires that the bond accountability committee review any audits related to the bond program. Um, so today's meeting helps us fulfill that responsibility. Um, second, uh, the external auditors have also presented to the board's school improvement and audit committees back on August 31st. So for those who are interested in those meeting records, you can find them on the PPS website. And um, there was a pretty robust discussion um, from the board representatives during that time. And then lastly, I wanna thank staff and Schoberg Evanshank for their dedication and flexibility in completing this audit, given operations dur during COVID. Um, you know, the first year of the performance audit contract was a really heavy lift because there were essentially two audit reports that were done in that one fiscal year. And then the second year ended up wrapping up during a global pandemic. So my hope is next year we'll have a more smooth experience for both OSM and the external audit team. So thank you. So Kathy and Leanne, did you want to go ahead with your presentation? Sure, I'll start it off and Leanne will get into the meat of it. And um, that's very interesting how you put that, Tins, and I hadn't thought about it like that. <laughs> but, you know, it's always fun to have audit be a little exciting anyway. So um, thank you again. I'm Kathy Grady. Um, and we are here to present the results from our year two performance audit of the 2017 bond program. Hey, to answer any questions you might have. Uh, since there are some new people on, um, on the committee, just to kind of have a little bit of a refresher that uh, PPS hired our firm in October of 2018 to conduct annual performance audits, the bond program, for at least a four-year audit cycle. So today's audit we're presenting covers activities from April 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2020. Um, and I gave a little bit of a background, um, but I'd like to get a little bit more depth on our firm, Schoberg Eva Shank Consulting, which is a big mouthful um, we were founded about 20 years ago by the California State Auditor at the time, Kurt Schoberg, and his Chief Deputy, Marianne Evashank, which is how we got our name. Um, and we served at the California State Auditor's Office, where we conducted audits that were similar to those done by your Oregon's uh, Secretary of State, and very similar to, I think, what Tenzin um, does as well, uh, the performance audits. So... Um, both at the auditor's office and with Schoberg Evashank, um, our experience includes a lot of education audits at K-12 schools or school districts. Um, we've looked at departments of education and higher ed as well at the community college and university levels. But we also do audits of other type of government programs and sectors. Um, a lot of our experience has been um, developed over the years with capital improvement and construction projects. We do quite a few of those. Um, some that are bond funded and others that are sales tax funded. But our firm is solely focused on public sector entities, uh, really just in the Western US. Uh, headquartered in Sacramento, California, uh, and, but we do have a local presence there in the Vancouver, Portland area. 
So many of you are, or I've heard this spiel before, but I just want to touch upon on the type of standards our audits follow because they're um, critical to what we do. They're the generally accepted government auditing standards, GAGAS, or the Yellow Book. And following these standards is the cornerstone of everything our firm does. We really believe that they bring such an essential accountability and transparency to public programs and that the standards provide a great framework to ensure the audit have the integrity and the objectivity and the quality that taxpayers want um, and that we want from our firm as well. Certain Yellow Book standards relate to general areas such as independence or ethical principles, continuing education that we as auditors have to um, abide by. And they also require us to plan and supervise our audits to ensure that our results, which is key for us, are based on sufficient and appropriate evidence. It's really one of the most important aspects of what we do and, and to me for in general, that our conclusions have to be based on evidence whether it's data or testing, observations or analyses, not just on unsupported opinion, not on our years of experience, not on hearsay, but on documented support for our audit results. So we take that very seriously. Um, among other areas, Yellow Book also has requirements related to audit reports. Um, I think a very important one from an auditee's perspective is that us as auditors must obtain and incorporate the views of responsible officials in our report. Um, I think it helps guarantee that that is included and, and hopefully the report has the right balance to it. Uh, one last point, this is for the auditees to highlight about the standards, is that us auditors also have to be audited. Um, every three years, we have to go through a peer review process where an independent auditor comes in and goes through all of our work and our policies and procedures and our reports to make sure that we follow our standards. So the standards form this framework for us conducting audits, the PPS. Uh, and what we do is um, annually to figure out the audit scope, we start with a lot of interviews um, with the PPS executive leadership, OSN management and staff. Um, external construction professional as warranted. And that may be the board and committee members as well, trying to get perspectives, concerns, challenges, things that work well, program status, what phase the project's at. And then we also gather and review some preliminary information to understand the current environment. So it's not in-depth testing at that point, but we're looking maybe at some project files or some meeting notes project status reports, a contract, or maybe it's just prior audit um, status, whether it be our audits or someone else's audits. And then we have that information to do a high-level risk assessment and possible areas for audit. Um, during that point, we also consider where a project is in phasing. For instance, it does make a lot of sense to review construction management practices if a project is in an early design phase. So, Based on all of those planning efforts, we draft an initial work plan and then we meet with OSM and the BA, BAC audit subcommittee to refine and add and remove areas before we finalize the audit scope for the next year. So we're in process of doing that for the year three audit. Um, but to talk about the specifics on the 2019 audit scope and results, um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the end Lou. Thank you, Kathy. So as you can see on this slide, our year two scope focused on five main areas, the 2017 bond status, health and safety, construction management, contracts and procurement, and prior audit recommendation. Like last year's audit report, you will find a section discussing each of these areas, as well as a short three and a half page bullet type executive summary for those of you who just need the key results and recommendations. The report also contains um, PPS's response as a PPC on page 49, and I believe Marina will provide additional details on that in a little bit. So with that, let's get to the details. In section one of the report, we looked at the overall status of the bond program and the progress that has been made through really December 31st, 2019. We mined through expenditure and total data in OSM eBuilder system, and look at how that system reconciles with GPS financials to be comfortable that the data provided to us for analysis is reliable. We, we also visited the Madison construction site 
And with this being our second year auditing the program, we hope we have seen a lot of changes since the fall of 2018, where projects were still in master planning. So for Madison and Kellogg, those two schools appear to be on schedule to be open for the 2021-2022 school year. Lincoln, based on schedules that we saw, is anticipated to have all phases completed by 2023, which only leaves us with Benson, for which construction is anticipated to wrap up in August 2024. In terms of cost, based on the scope and estimates as of January of this year, the bond will require approximately $1.08 billion to complete the current portfolio of projects by 2024. The concern with that is that the Benson High School project is estimated to cost $357 million. The cash flow projections for Benson indicate that the 2017 bond will only have $67 million available through December 2021 to pay for Benson expenses. At that time, in December 2021, Benson will be in the middle of construction and having cash available during that time is obviously critical to move forward. We understand that the board has passed a resolution to fund Benson with a full faith and credit loan in case the November 2020 bomb does not pass, which would ensure continued work at Benson. But what, what, but what we wanted to point out with this recommendation is that there needs to be further analysis provided to the board about the impact the repayment of such a loan would have on other PPS commitments so that the board is fully aware and can make informed decisions about how funds will be spent. Section two of the report summarizes our audit results regarding the bonds health and safety program. The health and safety program was an area where we did spend a lot of ed audit effort reviewing information and discussing status and progress with OSM. And as you can see from the section title, the main takeaway is that a lot of progress has been made across all health and safety areas. But from a public perspective, answering a simple question such as what has been done was not easy. We spent time looking through data in eBuilder, talked to health and safety project managers, reconciled information presented to you, the Bond Accountability Committee, and had numerous working sessions with Marina's team until we got to a point where we could say, say something more than just how much money has been spent on health and safety. So on this slide, you can see that improvements have occurred at many school sites, and in some instances, even more was done than initially envisioned by the bond. What was challenging for us to identify was which of the nearly 100 schools within the district received what type of improvement since information available was limited. Although we learned that OSM is developing an interactive map to provide a better visual of where improvements happened across the district, that was not yet publicly available during the audit. So since that map is not ready, the audit attempted to write a simple summary of what has been done with the 150 million set aside by the bond. And this is what it looks like. A listing of all schools and simple summary of what was done. I know it's very small for the slide, but exhibit six on page 15 of the report has a bigger image. So for example, the first school on this list, Abernathy, had lead paint issues corrected, while Riggler, um, number 56, had work done in all areas except radon and security. But with this table, we can see that there has been volumes of work accomplished over the past two summers since the 2017 bond passed. However, this type of comprehensive status information was not available at the time of our review. And because of that, we are recommending that OSM completes the interactive map. There should be also supplemental information um, about the health and safety program on budget, schedule, and status, so that the public at any point in time really knows what is going on with health and safety improvements. Additionally, to be able to provide that information, OSM needs to make sure that internal systems and tools in place for capturing health and safety data are reliable and accessible to all project team members so that health and safety reporting needs to oversight bodies and the public can be better met. Section three of the report provides our audit results on how OSM is managing the day-to-day -day construction of the bond projects. 
We found that OSM practices in place are in line with construction industry leading practice and management of the construction projects was solid. And what we did to arrive at that conclusion was for key elements of construction management, we evaluated practices and protocols in place to see whether what OSM is doing mitigates risks related to project delay or cost increases. As you can see on this slide, we found good practices such as regular progress meetings, review of construction payment requests, and frequent construction site inspection, as well as facilitating open lines of communication between project managers, contractors, and the architect by having them on site in trailers to help with delivering a successful project. Continuing on to the areas where we noted improvements could be made during construction management. We found that while the process to review monthly payment applications is strong, the process to review change orders could be enhanced by requiring project team members to upload records of cost negotiations, notes, or other marked up quotes into eBuilder to allow for adequate evidence supporting OSM's due diligence in reviewing contract change order prices and ensure costs are adequately managed, overruns contained, and to really minimize risk of potential future claims or disputes. The next section, section four, contains our audit results on OSM's procurement and contracting of services for the school modernizations and the health and safety program. Before we go into details, I would like to briefly explain two different project delivery methods, one being design bid build or DBB, and the other being construction manager, general contractor, or CMGC. On the DBB method, which is being used to construct Kellogg, as well as on most health and safety projects, PPS hires an architect first to help with the design. And then once those designs are done, hires a contractor to actually build the project according to plan. The lowest bid contractor typically gets the job. On the other side, you have the CMGC method where you still have an architect, but you bring on the contractor or CMGC early in design to get feedback from a contractor construction perspective and negotiate the construction contract as designs are finalized. There are differences in the procurement and contracting process depending on which delivery method is used. We have highlighted those differences as in um, exhibit 14 of the report. But what is important for you to know is that the CMGC processes employed at OSM for Madison and Lincoln aligned with leading practices and peer districts that we looked at. However, we do have a few recommendations related to CMGC procurement as shown on this slide. The first one, which is probably the more important one, relates to the CMGC contract for Lincoln, where the contractor performed work during pre-design before the actual contract was signed. We understand there were challenges surrounding the negotiation of that contract, but regardless, contractors should not be allowed to perform any work prior to a contract being fully executed and signed by all parties, since it's just unnecessarily increasing liability for PPS. Recommendation number seven is geared towards a formal evaluation of the CMGC delivery method once Madison and Lincoln are complete to ensure that benefits and challenges are looked at closely and that adjustments can be made going forward um, for future capital school projects. This is really to minimize potential cost increases or schedule impacts from past lessons learned. Recommendation number eight is somewhat related to recommendation seven, but instead of a um, post-mortem look, it is intended to have OSM present to the board and the USC and discuss in real time rationale and decisions regarding the timing of when construction costs under the GMP are negotiated with the contractor. This provides for greater transparency and accountability of important decisions OSM is making on a daily basis to move projects forward. With regard to the CMGC contracts themselves, we found they were comprehensive and again, generally contained content that aligned with best practices. But there was some contract language in the architect and the CMGC contracts for Madison and um, health and safety projects that could be clearer and more consistent to avoid any confusions or disputes over contract terms. 
One of them related to a Oregon administrative rules where contractors should maintain financial records in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The other related to addressing inconsistencies in the timing of cost estimates provided by the architect and the contractor during the design phase to ensure that those two estimates are based on the same set of specifications so that resulting estimates can be more easily reconciled and there's really no gap in expectations. Lastly, there were some inconsistencies in how contractor payment language for health and safety work was interpreted and the level of detail and documentation needed to approve the payment. Going on to the next and almost final slide. Um, government auditing standards, as Kathy mentioned earlier, require that we follow up on prior audit recommendations related to our scope of work. What that means is to the extent possible, we are actually looking to validate whether OSM and PPS have really addressed the audit recommendation based on the responses they previously provided. So we found that OSM is taking the bond performance audits and resulting recommendations seriously. As shown on this slide, when looking at the status of our firm's recommendations for the 2017 bond, as well as the 2012 bond audits conducted by a different firm, we found that many recommendations had been completed, with steady progress even made on the 19 recommendations that we just issued um, last year. So since that time, OSM has formed an implementation team with senior level decision-making staff, created and posted an audit implementation tracker on the bond site, and regular reports um, the, on progress to the BAC. All of these steps help ensure continued program improvement and demonstrate accountability to taxpayers. Um, this concludes our presentation, but I think we're holding off on questions. Um, until Marina had a chance to provide some um, comments. If that sounds good, I'll turn it over to Marina. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to go ahead and try to present. Uh, the responses that we shared with the um, combined bond and audit committee. And bear with me, I've been having some challenges with presentation. So, I may have to go through them uh, just with I may have to do them just verbally. I'm having some challenges with my computer uh, allowing me to, to share things that aren't on the uh, on the browser already. So I apologize for that. Um, but it's fairly easy to, to go through these um, verbally. You probably don't need a, a graphic um, presentation to walk with me. So SEC had 11 recommendations. Um, of those 11 recommendations, we concurred with five. We concurred with some additional comment on four. We had one that we had completed prior to the audit report publication, and we had one that was a non-concur. Of the five that were concurs, uh, one of those was recommendation number four, which is completing the development of the interactive map tool and including health and safety information. Um, we absolutely agree with that. We are working on it currently, and uh, we're looking forward to bringing that out very soon. In addition, uh, we are actually putting together PDF uh, maps of health and safety projects across the district from 2012 to current. Um, so those will also be shared on our website soon. Recommendation number five, we concur. We do need to require more consistent documentation associated with review of price proposals. The other three are all contract terms and conditions, which we agree with all of those. Recommendation number nine, clarifying language in our CMGC contracts related to contractor financial records being per the GAAP standard. Recommendation number 10, addressing inconsistencies between our contracts regarding timing of reconciled estimates. And recommendation number 11, evaluating the terms and conditions across all of our health and safety lumps and contracts for consistency of language practices. Of the recommendations that we 
uh, concurred with comment. Generally, that is intended to say that we concur, but we want to provide some additional information um, to help better, um, to provide some better context for the concur. So recommendation number three was revisiting systems and tools on a go forward basis for capturing health and safety project expenditures and data for reporting. And we absolutely concur with that. We do know that over time, we have changed some practices uh, in how we manage projects within our eBuilder software system. And we just wanted to note that we cannot go back and sort of regroup or reallocate projects that have already been completed. We are certainly looking to improve always on a go forward basis. Um, but we will continue to see that there are some challenges with collecting data on those past projects where we've we've since learned better ways to, to um, put them through our system. Recommendation number six, prohibiting contractors to perform any work prior to fully executed contracts being in place. Um, we did want to note contractors are already prohibited from performing work prior to contract execution. Uh, what should have happened is we should have provided a formal written authorization through Lincoln High School for the contractor to be able to participate in the formal value engineering workshop prior to execution of the CMGC agreement. Recommendation number seven, conduct a post-project completion analysis of Madison and Lincoln High School projects. Um, post-project evaluations are already required by ORS 279C. Um, those are post-project evaluations for any project that has gone through an alternative procurement method. That analysis cannot be completed until after the latter of the date of final payment or the date of final completion. We note this simply to say that we will not be able to resolve this recommendation until after the projects are complete um, in 2022 for Madison and 2024 for Lincoln. We will, of course, do the post-project completion analysis. We're just noting it will be a little while before we check that one off the list. Recommendation number eight, um, memorialize the rationale and decisions of the BAC related to GMP negotiation timing. Uh, we do regularly discuss GMP timing with the BAC. Um, however, we'll look to include it as a specific topic for projects where we have not yet established the GMP um, in the future. The recommendation that we completed was that of number two, implementing a plan to ensure project team members have needed access to eBuilder and non-PPS staff have computers to access project information. We have upgraded our licensing with eBuilder to allow for unlimited users, and we are now providing unlimited access to consultants, contractors, designers, and subconsultants. We have also purchased PPS computers for all OSM staff, including contracted staff, to provide easier access to the PPS network for all members of the team. The non-concur recommendation is recommendation number one. Um, that recommendation is to provide the Board of Education with analysis of applications on the Benson High School project if the 2020 bond is not passed. Um, we have noted that an alternative funding mechanism was already included in Resolution 5780 that was passed by the Board in the event that the November 2020 bond is not passed. If it does not pass, we will, of course, be providing additional cash flow information to um, the finance department and to the board to be able to make decisions regarding that um, full faith and credit loan that they have um, already approved to complete the project in the event the bond does not pass. I think that covers all of the response to the audit recommendations. Um, one thing we did provide to the combined audit bond committee was just kind of a general run through of how we manage audit recommendations and happy to provide that as well. Or we can leave that for another discussion um, with the BAC at a different time. I want to make sure that I provide enough time for um, questions to SEC. Yeah, that sounds good. Did, does anyone have any questions um, for Kathy and Leanne and also for Marina or other or, or Scott about the audit report or the response from PPS? Uh, 
How do you raise your hand on this uh, program? Just visually? <laughs> okay. I just like to comment that I found your audit to be just excellent. Very, very helpful, very clear. And actually, I think it's essential for the back to have this kind of analysis, uh, observation and analysis and reporting. So I thank you very much. Thank you. This is Dick. I'll just uh, jump in. I had a couple of different thoughts. Let me just throw one out first. I guess I'm this this question would be addressed to the audit team itself. And um, so we've we've obviously seen OSM's response to the specific audit recommendations. Is the audit team satisfied with those or do you have any concerns? Just making sure I'm unmuted. No, we don't have any um, concerns with their responses. Um, you know, there is going to be the year three. Fortunately, on these repeat audits, we can always go back and see what the status is. And if something that is, um, they said they completed or, you know, will be completing in the future, there's always opportunity for us to follow up on. But, um, you know, there was no... Um, as you can see from the report, any recommendation where we felt like we had to provide any additional comments or even a rebuttal on it. So um, there was, you know, no disagreement on our end or concern, really. Did that answer your okay. question? Yep, yep, sure did. Um, so another question, and one of the recommendations spoke to this a bit. Um, I wondered if the audit team had any thoughts about the information that's routinely provided to the BAC for our quarterly reviews and for us to perform the duties that have been assigned to us in terms of oversight and recommendations to the board. Do you feel we are getting what we need? Are there pieces of information that you think we should be getting that we're not getting or that are missing or any thoughts about that? Let me go first. So yes, we definitely, you know, that was one of the first items that we're going, um, we went to look at is the, the packets that go to the board, the packets that go to the BAC in terms of information on the bond programs. It would be really um, an entire scope in itself. And we're doing audits, just looking at the sort of the meeting material and the packets and the communication that goes back and forth between um, the like a OSM or a accountability committee and the board. So we didn't really focus this time on the types or level of detail or information provided. We certainly have attended several um, BAC um, meetings and you know they were very thorough, we thought. You know, there's it seems like there have been improvements made over the course of the years in terms of the types of information presented. But we haven't really, um, you know, looked at if it could be more or less better or compared to, to others. Um, and for us as auditors, I think if certain information was not available or presented to the BAC or the board, we could always go to the source, ask Marina and her team, or go to eBuilder and find it. So that was not really necessarily a challenge for us. Um, but um, you know, I'm sure there's ways that things can improve or, but it was not something that we specifically looked at um, as part of this audit. Okay, last question for me. Um, one of the challenges that, that I know I experienced in working with CNGC contracts um, kind of over and over again would be after the GMP is set and the contractor claims entitlement for additional compensation because of um, uh, design clarifications or, or you know whatever the issue might be it's it's sorting through what should have been included in in the GMP as a contractor risk and as a contractor uh, cost to bear versus what the owner should pay for in addition did you do you have any comments about um, about that, about the approach that OSM uses to resolve those dilemmas? Um. So I may need um, some help from OSM, but I can tell you what we 
try to, and this was a little bit um, not challenging, but we tried to not duplicate efforts because there is the construction audits for the um, Madison um, Lincoln going on as well. And we try to stay away from any type of progress payment reviews or the GMP negotiation part of that, because that um, process is handled by a different auditor. So what we looked at was just really the general practices surrounding how they, the timing of the GMPs, um, you know, the type of information that goes into that and the negotiation part of it. We didn't sort of, and I correct me if I'm wrong, what you're asking is looking and sort of like the before and after. So what have they negotiated? And then once they were in construction, if there were any issues that came up and how they handled that, we did not specifically look at that for um, neither Madison or Lincoln. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if Marina wants to add anything to that or clarify, but. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would just add, Delian, there's so much you can do with these construction contracts. And with having the, the Curtis Matthews in there doing sort of one piece of it, you know, really to dive in to get into some of those specific details when a, you know, a cost comes up, whether it's through a change order or something to get down and figure out whose responsibility it should be. Um, and, and that risk management and everything associated with it really does take, you know, some time and, but certainly is, you know, risky on some of those CMGC with the GMP projects. But we thought that that was something that was being, um, you know, more looked at in depth by him. Any other questions, comments? Um, I had one comment and then a question for Marina. Um, so my comment was about the health and safety portion of the audit report. Um, I just wanted to commend the audit team on the analysis that was done. I feel like we spent a lot of time um, during the quarterly meetings going through a lot of detail and sometimes it's hard to step back and kind of um, kind of get a summary of kind of what all that all that's been done on the health and safety front. And there's been a tremendous amount of progress that PPS has done in that area. And I think that the visualizations you have on the audit report really show that off. Um, and I'm really excited to hear from Marina that um, that interactive or at least some sort of mapping um, will be available to the public prior to something like prior to the November vote. So I think that'll be a really um, helpful kind of storytelling opportunity for PPS. Um, and the second, um, the question I had, uh, Marina, you mentioned about the post project completion report, and it, and it sounds like that um, it wouldn't be applicable. I mean, it's too early to do that work right now for the, the two projects that Schoberg Evanshank reviewed um, for this audit. But I'm wondering if um, that's been done for the 2012 projects. I kind of, I think I started on the BAC right after Franklin was finished. And I know Grant, we're still wrapping up. So I'm wondering if um, maybe we can get a copy of, of a, if there's been a report done, maybe we can see a copy of what that would look like just to kind of get a sense of uh, what we might be able to anticipate in a couple of years. We've, uh, we have talked about it at a couple of the BAC meetings. Um, the, the Franklin report is the first one that will get completed. We have been drafting that. And um, I just want to kind of, refer back to we can't complete the report until either the later of the project has been completed or the final contract closeout, right? So the reason we can't do that is because there's significant financial data that goes along with the contract. Um, until we close out the contract, we don't have those final numbers. So um, it's hard to do an analysis without that, without that final data. Um, the Franklin contract um, once it closed out, we started working on that analysis. Um, we discovered that there's, there are not a lot of examples out there of this type of analysis. And so we're, we're kind of um, forging ahead uh, to, to do the best job that we can do. What we found tended to be fairly superficial, um, pretty slim. And I think what we want to do is actually get something out of it. We're not looking to just check the box. We want to, we want to get some, 
you know, information and lessons learned out of it. So um, we're, we're crafting that. This is the first one that we're doing. Um, and we're, we're uh, still in the draft of that one. Um, Roosevelt um, only recently uh, did final closeout. And I, I say recently, like really, really, really recently. And um, Grant, of course, is not through final closeout yet. So that will have to wait until that one is closed out. Um, our emphasis right now is to get Franklin done. That'll give us kind of a template. And uh, I think we'll Rena, you're Rena, you're muted. You're not coming across. I think we got the kind of the gist of what Marina was saying though, in terms of, it sounds like the Franklin report is in draft form. Um, that'll be the template for any future uh, reports that will be done for Roosevelt and for Grant. Is that correct? Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I lost my um, phone connection there briefly. I could still see everybody, but I couldn't hear anything and I wasn't sure if you could hear me, so I apologize. There's always some technical difficulty with one of these meetings, right? <laughs> Always. Okay. Um, do we have more questions? Do you okay. want to close it out, Tenzin? Yeah, if not, I just want to thank everyone for their time. And again, um, Thanks to both um, PPS staff as well as Schoberg and Edvinshank for all of their dedication and persistence and patience um, with this audit. We'll look forward to kind of talking about the year three planning and, and kind of um, checking in with, in with folks about the progress um, throughout this next fiscal year. Sounds great. Thank you all. We'll look forward to working with the new members too. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye. you.